seem like everything that's been said this morning, everything that that is has been done this morning, the songs, everything kind of goes along with what I want to talk to you about this morning. Uh, everybody doing okay this morning? I got anybody still asleep out here? We all good and awake. But Derek said he's good. Been back there pounding on them drums, doing a good job on them. Got a good looking crowd here this morning. Good looking crowd. I've got a subject this morning and everybody gets kind of settled. I, I, I want to talk to you just for a little bit this morning about dealing with disappointment. Dealing with disappointment. Has anybody ever had any disappointments in life? It seems like Brother Johnny's already kind of given us the answer to what my lesson's going to be about because it's going to be about focusing on Jesus, Brother Larry. He's kind of he's already went there. So it kind of makes me feel a little bit better about what I've got to teach this morning because sometimes we lose sight of who's in control. We lose sight of who's still on the throne when everyday life hits us in the face. So I want to talk to you just a little bit this morning about dealing with disappointments. Genesis 29, verses 15 through 18, and I'm going to read verse 31. It said, And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother... And what he means there, it's, it's his kin, because Laban is actually his uncle. Shouldest thou therefore serve me not? Tell me what, why thy, what shall thy wages be? And Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah means tired. Leah means tender-eyed. Uh, and in other words, if you hate to say it like this, Leah was kind of a homely-looking girl. It's just the way the scripture defines her. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel, the word Rachel means you. She was beautiful and well-favored. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. She couldn't have children, and that was uh, that was kind of common in the Bible if you'll Look at the early years within the Bible, barren women. Sarah was barren, Brother Marcus, until she was 90 years old, and then she gave birth to Isaac. Uh, Manoah's wife, which was Samson's mother, was barren. She gave birth to Samson. Hannah, after pouring her heart out in the sanctuary and vowed to give her son back to God, accused of being drunk in the sanctuary or in the tabernacle by Eli the priest, gave birth to a boy named Samuel that became a prophet. Rebekah was barren, and Isaac prayed, and she gave birth to Esau and Jacob. And the Bible says this about Rachel. Rachel said, give me children, or I'll die. Later on in the story, she said, give me children, or I'll die. And as I, as I prayed this week, I began to seek after the Lord about this lesson, and my mind went back. I got to go to the Because of the Times in 2013. It was such a great experience. And the slogan for that, that conference was, hear the voice. Hear the voice, and that's exactly what I want us to try to do today, is hear the voice of the Lord, Brother Larry, to hear what he's got to say to us. And I, I know that somehow, through the word of God, that it's going to touch somebody's life. And it kind of echoes what Brother G.L. has been teaching and preaching to us here lately. The story I want to look at, most of us, if you grew up in church, you're familiar with it. Brother Billy, you're familiar with the story of Jacob, and it deals with Jacob and his family and the two women who would become his wives, one due to trickery of her father and the, and the one because she was loved. But both had to suffer and deal with disappointments that their situations in their lives brought them. Now, there's an old saying that says life isn't fair. Everybody heard that? Life isn't fair sometimes. It's not a negative thing to say. It's simply realistic. All of our experiences in life teaches us that it's true. Life is not always fair, Sister Kesley. It's not always fair. We see the innocent suffer while the wicked prosper. We watch hard work go unnoticed while it seems like laziness sometimes is promoted. Those, those are the ones that get the promotions at work. It often seems that way. We feel as if our situations and the things that we go through in our life are unique and nobody's ever had to face them before, Sister Margaret. We feel that way. And everything that we experience in life sometimes is difficult. Sometimes it's hard. 
But Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 9 and 11, he speaks these words. He said, I returned and I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. But time and chance happeneth to them all. It happeneth to them all. The key part in this verse is the final phrase, to them all. The only fairness about life is that it's unfair to everyone. We're all going to taste of life's bitterness. If you live long enough, that's just the way it's going to be. We're not always going to get our heart's desires, and we're not always going to get what we want, but that's just the way it is. And sometimes it seems unfair. No one escapes its injustices. The rich, the poor, the good, the bad. There's unfairness for all, and all have tasted of life's bitterness. Begin to look at this, and it's ironic that the tragedies that make up the unfairness of life are only a part of the story. There's sickness and there's loss. There's trouble in the family. There's financial struggles and a thousand other calamities that people deal with, which are made even worse when they're undeserved. When these things happen to us, Brother Ray, and we can't explain why they're happening to us, but it rains on the just and it rains on the unjust. As I said, life is just sometimes it's unfair. There's no rhyme or reason to why it happens for us. Sometimes it makes no sense at all in our, in our outrage or our anger becomes even more intensified through our suffering and what we have to deal with. Anybody ever been there this morning? You just can't explain it in your anger. You're angry at life and you become angry at God because these things are happening to us. And it's unexplained. But Brother Johnny said that we need to keep our focus on God. We need to keep our focus on God. And sometimes it's not always easy to do. I'm speaking for myself because I've been there many, many times. I want to say, well, why did God allow this to happen to me for? Why did this, why did I have to go through this when I'm trying to do everything that I can and try to be faithful? Why does it have to happen for? It's just life sometimes. It's just life sometimes. That's a brutal answer, but sometimes it's just life. But it's, it's, even, it's even greater when I have the Lord in my life. Sister Michelle, when I have the Lord that I can turn to, when we've got sick children, we've got sick grandchildren, we've got somebody that we can turn to that can take care of the problem. If we don't lose our faith and we don't lose our hope in the one that's in control. The story of Job is one of life at its best and life at its worst. Even though he was driven to frustration by his undeserved suffering and the insensitive accusations of his friend, they come around, his three friends come around, and Job, what did you do? What, what, what kind of sins did you commit to deserve this? And the Bible says Job was a perfect and an upright man, one that eschewed fear, evil and he feared God. There wasn't anything that Job had done wrong, Brother Pete. I, I look at that story quite often. Job said, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all of this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Though he slay me, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. If he takes my life through these calamities that have followed me, through this sickness that has been on my body, yet will I trust him. That is an awesome testimony. That is an awesome word. Job 23, 8 and 10, Job says, I go forward, but he's not there, and backwards, but I cannot perceive him. On the left, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him, but he knoweth the way that I take. He knows where I'm at. I might not know where he's at. I might not be able to feel him. I might not be able to perceive him, but he knows where I'm at. He knows where you're at this morning. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows where I'm at. And when he hath tried me, you see, the things that befell Job was because God allowed them to happen. God asked, 
God asked the devil, he said, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in all the land. He said, you take the heads down around him and let me afflict him for a little bit. He's going to curse you to your face. God said, no, that's not going to happen. I've got faith in Job. I've got faith in Job. He can handle the things that's going to happen to him. He can handle the things that he's going to have to go through. Job stood strong through the disappointments. He lost his seven sons and his three daughters. And the Bible says there was none as beautiful as Job's daughters in all the land. He lost all of his animals. He lost everything that he had. His wife said, why don't you curse God and die? Won't you just curse God to his face and die? He lost everything. His body was afflicted. He had boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. And the Bible said he took a pot shirt, which is like a scraper. It was like a piece of pottery, and he would scrape the sores from his body where the pus run out. From the top of his head to the soles of his feet. This is what Job had to endure, and this was what Job had to go through. And he said, I'm going to trust him. I'm going to trust him. No matter what happens, I'm going to trust him. That's a testimony. Job stood through the disappointments that came his way, and the Bible says that the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than the beginning. He received double of everything that he had. He had seven more sons and three more daughters. The Lord blessed him twofold because he stood true to the Lord. Most of us will never suffer, will never suffer the losses that Job had to go through in his life. No, most of us will never have to face that. But that does not mean we're not deeply affected by the unfairness of life that we encounter at times. Sometimes it just seems like it's just more than we can bear, more than we can take, take of, but the Lord knows how much we can take. He said he will not allow you to be tempted above what you can take. And he went through everything that you and I will ever face. And the Bible says he came forth without sin. He endured everything that you and I are going to face. Oh, he was God incarnate, but he was also a man. He got hungry. He got sleepy. He got tired. He felt the physical emotions that you and I feel, the mental emotions that you and I feel. And the Bible says that without sin, he did not have any sin in his life. The story of Jacob is, is one that we're pretty well all familiar with. The Lord told Rebecca about the struggling taking place in her womb. She said, Lord, what's going on here? And he said, there's two nations and there's two manner of people that are in your womb. One is stronger than the other and the elder shall serve the younger. That was already told by the Lord what was going to take place. I don't think he wanted it exactly to take place the way it happened, but he said it was going to happen, Brother Larry. Esau was the stronger and the oldest of the two, a hunter of the field. History kind of tells us that he was, he was a hunter. He liked to hunt. He was kind of a hairy individual. He was kind of redheaded. He was just a man's man, if you will. And then here, here came Jacob. He grasped the heel of his brother as he came out of the womb. And they looked at him and they named him Jacob, which means surplanter. It means deceiver. It means liar. Can you imagine naming your small son that? In those days, names were very important. And they looked at him and they said, we're going to name him Jacob, which means liar. It means deceiver. It means conniver. That's what this young boy is going to be when he gets older. One who takes place of another without a right to do so. He was the youngest. He was the mama's boy. He liked to stay around mama's skirt, t skirt tail. The one who cheated his brother out of the birthright for a bowl of red pottage. The one who deceived his father to receive the blessings of the birthright. And the one that had to flee home because Esau was going to kill him. He stole the birthright from his brother. He went in and deceived his father. His father was old and he couldn't see. And his mom helped him. And they put skins on his, on his arms and stuff. And his dad would feel of him. And his dad gave him the birthright. And he blessed him because he deceived him. He lied to him. He lived up to his name. And because Esau found out. Esau said, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to take your life for what you've done. Even though he had already told him that he could have the birthright for a bowl of pottage because he thought he was going to, he thought he was going to die. So he, he had to flee home. And the Bible says along the way he found a place to lay his head. He laid his head on a rock. And he began to have a dream. And there was a dream about angels going forth up and out of heaven on a, a, a huge ladder. 
And when he woke up, he said, I'm going to name this place Bethel, which means house of God. He said, because surely God was in this place, and I knew it not. God told him, he said, look here, son, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you your heart's desire. I'm going to make a promise not to leave you. I'm going to be with you the rest of your life, and I'm going to bless you. We know the 12 nations came out of Jacob. When Jacob arrived in the east, he came to a field where three flocks of sheep lay scattered around a well, where the shepherds were waiting to remove the stones from the well to water the flock. Jacob begins to question these guys. He begins to talk to them, and he asks them, he said, where do you live at? And they said, we live in Haran. And he said, well, that's where, that's where my uncle lives at. My uncle Ab Laban lives there. Do you, do you know Uncle Laban? And they said, yeah, we, we know who he is. He said, matter of fact, his daughter Rachel is coming toward him, leading a flock of sheep to the well. The Bible makes it sound like this, fellas. The minute he laid eyes on this young lady, it was love at first sight. He immediately fell in love. Yes, it was his cousin, but that's the way things were back then. And he fell in love with her. It was love at first sight. He would do anything to have Rachel. He loved Rachel so much it was love at first sight. So Jacob uncaps the well for his sheep to drink. If you want to look at the story, Sister Judy, the story of Jacob and Rachel is kind of a, a romance story. It's, it's love at first sight. So much, in fact, fellas, and I want you to listen to this, maybe even look at your wives. He told his uncle Laban, he said, I'm going to work for you for seven years and not receive any wages. I'm not going to receive any pay. Seven years if, if you promise her hand to me in marriage. All he had was a little bit of room, a little bit of board. And all the whole time, the seven years, the Bible says the seven years, Brother Larry, that he worked for Laban. Laban's goods was increased. Laban was blessed because what God had told him. But he was willing to work for this long young lady for seven long years. Can you imagine what it was like for Jacob working every day, day after day, and Laban's getting richer? The time passed quickly. The Bible says, the Bible says that it seemed to a few days, for he loved her. Seven years just flew by in Jacob's life as he loved Rachel. At last the seven years were over, Rachel was going to be his bride. The wedding day had finally arrived. And the Bible doesn't give us a whole lot of insight to this. It doesn't give us a lot of story about what happened. The Bible not, 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 not tell us what took place. It just says that night, the night of the wedding, Uncle Laban snuck Lee into Jacob's tent that night, and Jacob went in to be with her. We're all, we're all adults in here. They consummated the marriage. Now, poor old Jacob. I don't know what he was thinking, Brother Billy. I, I, I don't know what took place, but the next morning when he woke up and he looked over at his bride, it wasn't the one that he worked seven long years for. It was her sister Leah. Can you imagine the emotions that he felt? Can you imagine what was going through his mind? I've been tricked. I've been deceived. Uncle Laban lied to me. Well, the Bible says you're going to reap what you sow. He got a little bit of what was given back to him, and he, he confronted his uncle. He said, why'd you do this to me for? He said, well, it's, it's our custom. It's our custom not to give the youngest before the eldest. You know, I, I had to give you leave before you could get Rachel. He said, but I'll tell you what I'll do. If you work another seven years for me, I'll let you have Rachel at the end of it, buddy. What do you think about that? Jacob said, I, I, I'll do it. He, he said, I, I'm willing 14 years to marry Rachel. He loved her so much that he was willing to work 14 years. The Bible says that's a week-long week wedding fest feast when the women he did not, with a woman he did not love. According to the scripture, Jacob did as Laban asked, and at the end of the week, Laban asked, you gave him Rachel also to be his wife, knowing that Jacob would keep his word. He let him have her. He worked seven more years for her. Now, this is where the focus of the lesson comes in. This is where I want to deal with the topic about dealing with disappointment. Two young women whose lives were forever changed. Two sisters. No doubt they might have been close at one time. They grew up together. They played together. 
Maybe they were best friends. Because of the trickery of their dad, because of the trickery of their dad, it drove a wedge between them. Disappointment became a part of their lives. The Bible says Jacob went into Rachel and he loved Rachel more than Leah. And he, was, and he served with Laban seven more years. And the Lord saw that Leah was hated. So he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. He made it where the one that he did not love could have children. And the one that he loved was barren. She couldn't have any kids. Jacob was cheated for the rest of, a lot, with, for the rest of his life. He was married to a woman that he really did not love. He really never loved Leah. He loved Rachel, is what the Bible says. So you've got three individuals touched by this. Jacob was cheated for the rest of his life. He was married to a woman he did not love. Every time he looked at Leah, he would remember Laban's treachery, and it made him hate Leah. Rachel was cheated. She would forever share the man she loved with her sister, and she was a pawn in her father's scheme. Worst of all, her home became a battleground. It was a constant battleground between her and Leah and Jacob. Between her and Leah and the competition for Jacob's attention. While Jacob and Rachel were both cheated by Laban's greed and selfishness, the greatest victim in this tragedy to me was Leah. She didn't really ask for this. It wasn't her that fell in love with Jacob. Not in the beginning. She was the one that's the greatest tragedy. A young lady cheated out of her own wedding day. She didn't even get to know what it was to be a bride. She was just ushered into a tent in the middle of the night. She was probably compared to Rachel and everything she did, constantly seeing Jacob's affection and his tender loving graces at Rachel, hearing them speak to one another in loving tones. Day after day after day. And that's, this is the sad part to me. This is the cruel part. The Bible says that Leah fell in love with Jacob. She fell in love with Jacob. And that love, Brother Larry, became a driving force for her to win Jacob's love. I'm sorry to tell you it's a love that would never come. It was a tragedy. But the Bible says that God loved Leah. God loved Leah. He opened her womb. Proverbs 13 and 12 says, Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when desire cometh, it's a tree of life. When we set our hearts on something and we work toward it, never allowing anything to keep us from our goal, expecting to reach it, but yet we never quite get there. We never quite reach that goal that we want. We never get what we're after, what we're working for, what we really want in life. And that's when disappointment overshadows everything else. We get there, but we can't have it. We get there because we want it, but we can never receive it. And that's when disappointment overshadows everything else. We allow life to become bitter to us. And our anger are the results. We begin to wear a mask to disguise our true feeling. We're upset because we didn't get what we wanted. Maybe we wanted that job promotion. Maybe we wanted that raise. And it never came. And so life becomes bitter to us. Anybody ever been there? I think I'm talking to some people that have been there. I've been there. Life has become bitter at times. It's not become pleasant. It's not become a happy place. I listened to a message preached by Dr. Gerald Jeffords at Brother Terry Black's church in Memphis. And he preached a message about disappointment. And he used Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 6 as his focal point. He said there's a time to get, a time to lose a time to keep, a time to cast away. And it's not something that, we're, that we really want to hear. But there's going to be times when we lose. There's going to be times when life is unfair. Life will bring us troubles and trials. We'll experience sadnesses and a taste of disappointment. And it's at these times that we ask why. Why, Lord, why is it happening to me? Why does it seem to always happened to me why are we as Christians allowed to go through these times in our life why did God allow Job to suffer the pain in his life as I've already said I believe that God had the utmost faith in Job brother Billy that he could withstand whatever he was going through it was his faith 
in Joel to come, to come, come out stronger. The blessings of our trials and tests is determined. I want you to listen to this right here. The blessings of our trial and test is determined by how we handle the pressure and the disappointments. That is what's going to determine our character. That's, going, that's what's going to determine who we are. It's not only going to come through our, I mean, it's only going to come through our dependence on God. It's during these times that our character is formed. Who we truly are, Brother Jesse. Who we proclaim to be, who, who, who people will see us as. When we go through these, the year that I went to because of times, they showed some clips from earlier years, and one of them was a brother, Mur Mural Ewing. And he said there is power in holding on. He said there is power in holding on. As long as we hold on to God, Satan has to hold off. He said as long as we hold on to God, Satan has to hold off. He said never give up. He said, every tree goes through a process of seasons. It's going to be stripped, and it's going to lose its greenery. It's going to lose its fruit. But hold on, because springtime is coming. There is another season of fruitfulness coming. There's another season of fruitfulness coming in your life. The trials will only last so long. And there's going to be a time of fruitfulness. There's going to be a time of blessing where God is going to bless you. But we've got to hold on. I said we've got to hold on. We know God heals. We know he delivers and he restores. We know all these things are possible with God, but we also know there are times when he chooses not to. Sometimes he'll calm the storm. And sometimes he'll calm us within the storm. Isaiah 48 and 10 says, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. The furnace has fire in it. And God says, I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. And that word afflict means to grieve. It means to distress. It means disappointments and trials and tribulations in life. But we have to understand that it's during these times that God is proving us. God forges his character into us by fire to be able to unleash his power in us. I looked up that word forge, and it means shape by heating in a fire or furnace and then beating and hammering it. Sometimes we're going to have to go through the fire. Sometimes we're going to have to go through the furnace, and it's during that time that God is shaping us. It's during that time that God is molding us. Might be even some beating and some hammering going on. But God is working a work in our life. I said God is working a work in our life. That's what he wants. He wants to show us what he wants in our life. But sometimes we just got to hold on. Sometimes we just got to hold on. I think about the, the story of the three Hebrew boys and the king, King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold. It was a huge statue, and he said, every time that you hear the music, I want you to bow down, and I want you to worship this idol of gold. And whoever does not bow down and worship this idol of gold, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. And the Bible speaks to us about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The music went forth. The music was played. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't bow down, Brother Leonard. They chose not to bow down. And so the other people went and told the king, he said, these boys didn't bow down before your image. And it made him mad. The Bible says his visage was changed. He was angry. And he called the boys in, and he said, why didn't you bow? And the boys simply said, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, if he chooses not to deliver us out of that fiery furnace, be it known to thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods. I'm not going to change who I'm going to serve. I'm going to continue to serve the living God and to worship the golden image which thou hast set up. 
And the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar was full of furry. And he said, I want the furnace is heated seven times hotter than it normally is. And the Bible says that the men that threw Shadrach, ben Shad, Abednego into the fiery furnace, the fire consumed them. The fire was so hot that it consumed them and it killed them. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. They were thrown in, and they were bound. And Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and he rose up, and he said, Did we not cast three men bound to the midst of the fire? And they said, Yes, king, it's true. We, bound three, we sent three men in there. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, for the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. He was walking in the fiery furnace with them. And the Bible says they were thrown in bound, but they were loosed in the fiery furnace, and there were four walking in there. Don't tell me that God won't walk with you when you're going through the fiery furnace. When you're going through fiery trails, he's right there beside you, walking along with you. He's on your side. This is something else that amazed me, Brother Larry, as I was reading the story. He said, Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning, fiery furnace. Here these guys had already thrown them in, and it killed them. And Nebuchadnezzar went to the mouth, and he said, come forth. I want you boys to come forth. And the Bible says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fiery furnaces. And the priests and the governors and the captains and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose body... The fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head singed, neither their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. There was no signs, no evidence that it had ever been thrown into the fiery furnace because they had a fourth man walking along beside them. They had a fourth man that was protecting them. They had a fourth man that was keeping his eye on them and watching with them. When he delivered, whether he delivered them or not, the three Hebrew boys were willing to stand for God, and he brought them forth through the fiery furnace, Brother McKinney. He brought them forth with no harm done to them. Luke 21 and 19 says, In your patience, own or possess ye your own souls. Another word for patience is long-suffering. It's in our times of distress and disappointments through the trials that we come through. Through the trials that we face, it's important that we got to hold on and that we've got to trust God. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. 1 Peter 4 and 12 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened to you. David said in Psalm 66, 10 through 12, he said, For thou, O God, hast proved us, thou hast tried us as silver is tried. Thou brought us unto the net, and thou laidest affliction upon our loins. Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. We went through the fire and through water, but thou brought us out unto a wealthy place. Notice who David said allow these things to happen unto him. God Almighty allowed these things to happen to him. I said, God Almighty allowed these things to happen. And notice his attitude, Sister Eloise, toward his affliction. After all these things took place, God brought them into a wealthy place. God tries us, but we know that he's right there with us. He's right there by our side. He's watching over us, and he's got his hand upon us, even though sometimes we seem that we're all alone. And we're by ourselves. God is always there. God is always there. First Peter 4.13 says, But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be, a, be glad also with exceeding joy. And that word rejoice, the word re means to do it all over again. If you place a pot of water over an open flame and the water begins to boil, It'll begin to evaporate, and it'll begin to disappear. If the pot is not filled with water again and again, it will burn. The way to keep the fiery trial from burning us 
is to continually refill ourselves with the joy of the Lord, continually to refill ourselves with the Holy Ghost, to continually keep God active in our life, continually let Him be in control, because if not, it will burn you. I said, if not, it will burn you. God opened Leah's womb, and he allowed her to have children. Leah kind of saw this. She kind of used it to her own advantage. She kind of saw this as a tool instead of a blessing, and she thought of it as a way to make life fair. She wanted to kind of twist it to her own, to her own uh, advantage, if you will. Because a woman that produced children in those days were looked upon with favor. And I think a lot of times, as I read earlier, those ladies that were barren, God it would open their wombs and it would be for God's glory that those things were done. Leah named her first son Reuben. And the word Reuben means see me. She said, now Jacob will see me and he will love me. He won't ignore me. He'll be able to see me for who I am and my love for him. So she named her firstborn Reuben, which means see me. She was kind of trying to manipulate Jacob a little bit, if, she w- if you will. She was going to force life to fit her mold through God's blessings. Her second son, she named Simeon, which means hear me. And still Jacob's feelings didn't change toward Leah. Maybe, maybe he'll not only see me now, but maybe he'll hear me. Maybe he'll hear the love in my voice when I call out his name. Just maybe, just maybe things will begin to change. Her third son, she named Levi, which means join me. And still, Jacob did love her. Maybe he's going to see me. Maybe he's going to hear me. Maybe now he'll join me instead of going into the tent with Rachel. Leah was so focused on winning Jacob's love, she missed seeing the love of God expressed on her because God had opened her womb and allowed her to bear children. See me, hear me, join me was a reminder of Leah's struggles to be loved and accepted by Jacob. But things began to change in her heart. Things began to take place in her heart when her fourth son was born. When her fourth son On the way, a change began to take place in Leah. Maybe she finally saw the blessings that God had given her. Maybe she saw that God had opened her womb and made her blessed. Maybe she finally realized Jacob was never going to love her. Maybe she was determined in her heart to stop being dominated by what had happened to her, by relating to what had happened to her. Because she named her fourth son Judah. And the word Judah means praise. This time, this time in my life, I'm going to praise God. This time I'm going to praise God. I'm going to give God the praise. No matter what's taking place, I'm going to praise God. The praise means to express approval or admiration, to offer offer grateful homage. Our praise is a declaration of our faith and our trust. It expresses our belief that God is with us. And regardless of the situations that we find ourselves in, He will be faithful to us, and he will be able to see us through them. Whether he chooses to deliver us or not, he will always be there, Sister Eloise. Hebrews 13 and 15 says, By him, therefore, let us offer up the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that the fruit of our lips give thanks to his name. This is a simple message for all of us. When life cheats us, when life throws more at us than we can bear, the remedy is very simple and effective, but it has, to, it has the power to change everything. We have to turn our focus, and Brother Johnny said that, and I've got it in my lesson. You can read it. We've got to turn our focus to God. We've got to turn our focus to God. We can't lose sight of who's still in control, of who's still on the throne, who still loves us, who still cares for us. We can't lose sight of that no matter what we're going through in life. No matter what we're facing in life, he's still in control. David says in Psalms 121, he says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from which cometh my help. My help. What do we do when life cheats us? Life itself will cheat everybody at one time. 
What do we do when we do right and we play by the rules in that life is cruel to us? When we receive heartache and pain instead of joy. When we lose a companion or a loved one to a death that's unexplained. Maybe even a companion or a spouse come in and say, I don't love you anymore. I want a divorce. What do we do? We've got to trust God. We've got to hold on. We've got to know that he's still in control. What do we do if we're, if we're faithful and things still go wrong when life itself does not make any sense to us? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 6 through 10, For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be or he that heareth of me. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation, there were given to me a thorn in the flesh, the message of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord, I prayed three times that it would depart from me, that it would delete me, that I wouldn't have to suffer with it anymore. And God said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in, in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then, then am I strong. When I'm weak, when I can't do it, when I can't go through it, when I can't face it, then am I strong because that's when I depend on him, Sister Ken. That's when I trust in him. That's when I put it in his hand and said, Lord, it's yours. I'm relying on you. I can't do this on my own. Paul says, when I can't do anything about what's going on in my life, and I'm experiencing pain and suffering for Christ's sake. I'm weak, but also at the same time, I'm strong because that's when God steps in. That's when he steps in and takes control. Even though he prayed three times for the Lord to remove the thorn in his flesh, God said, no, Paul. No, Paul, I'm not going to do it. I want you to bear it. I want you to face it. I want you to live with it. I want you to go through it. I'm not going to take it out because my grace is sufficient for thee. It will keep you through anything that you have to face in life. Paul faced a lot more than you and I will ever have to face. If he was, if anything, he was the New Testament Job, if you will. What Job went through in the Old Testament, Paul faced in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 30. This is Paul's life. He said, of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, save one. When they beat you with a cat of nine tails, Brother Billy, they would wrap it around. It would have bits of bones and glass, and it would tear the flesh as it was ripped out. He went through that five times. Five times Paul went through that. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, and in perils in the city in the wilderness, in the sea, among false brethren, painfulness and washings often in hunger and thirst and fastings often in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of the churches, all the churches that he has started, Brother Larry. Who is weak? He said, I'm not weak. Who is offended? I burn not. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my inform infirmities. Paul said, I'm not weak. I don't care what I've had to go through. I'm not weak. I'm not offended. I've done this for God's sake. I went through it for Christ's sake. I'm not, it doesn't bother me. Sister Amanda sings a beautiful song. Says, hold on. There are going to be times when our world comes crashing down around us. Things that we have to go through. Things that we have to deal with. But we've got to hold on to God. To trust him because God loves us. His love is never, I want you to hear this. His love is never reflected in what we're going through. It's not punishment that he's putting upon us. And his love is never reflected 
by what you and I are going through. Don't gauge his love by the trials that we face because his love and his grace will always be constant in our lives. It will never change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. I want the musicians to come. I've got a, a, a words to a, a song that I want to read to you. I mentioned it the other night, and it, 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 it really has touched, touched my heart. It really, it really has touched me. I, I love it every time I get to hear it on K-Love. And it's, it's a song by a man by the name of Ryan Stevenson. And it says, Eye of the Storm is the name of the song. And it says, When the solid ground is falling out from underneath my feet, between the black skies and my red eyes, I can barely see. When I realize I've been let down by my friends and my family, I can hear the rain reminding me. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. When my hopes and dreams are far from me and I'm running out of faith, I see the future I pictured slowly fade away. And when the tears of pain and heartache are pouring down my face, I find my peace in Jesus' name. When the tests come in and the doctors say I've only got a few months left, it's like a bitter pill I'm swallowing. I can barely take a breath. And when addiction steals my baby girl and there's nothing I can do, my only hope is to trust in you. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. Psalm 62, 5 through 8, the Amplified Version tells us, For God alone my soul waits in silence and quietly submits to Him. For my hope is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress and my defense. I will not be shaken or discouraged. On God my salvation and my glory rest. He is the rock, an unyielding strength. My refuge is in God. Trust confidently in Him at all times, O people, and pour your heart before Him because God is a refuge for us. He is a safe place. Will you stand with me?